1Q84 by Haruki Murakami Book 3, Chapter 19 Ushikawa What he can do that most people can't It was a quiet, windless Thursday morning Ushikawa woke as usual before six and washed his face with cold water. He brushed his teeth as he listened to the NHK news on the radio, and he shaved with the electric razor. He boiled water in a pot, made instant ramen, and after he finished eating, drank a cup of instant coffee. He rolled up his sleeping bag, stowed it in the closet, and sat down at the window in front of his camera. The eastern sky was beginning to grow light. It looked like it was going to be a warm day. The faces of all the people who left for work in the morning were etched in his mind. There was no need to take any more photos. From 7 to 8.30, they hurried out the apartment building to the station. The usual suspects. Ushikawa heard the lively voices of a group of elementary school pupils heading off for school. The children's voices reminded him of when his daughters were little. His daughters had thoroughly enjoyed elementary school. They took piano and ballet lessons and had lots of friends. To the very end, Ushikawa had found it hard to accept that he had these ordinary, happy kids. How could someone like him possibly be the father of children like these? After the morning rush, almost no one came in or out of the building. The children's lively voices had disappeared. Ushikawa laid aside the remote control for the shutter, leaned against the wall, smoked a cigarette, and kept an eye on the entrance through a gap in the curtain. As always, just after 10 a.m., the mailman came on his small red motorcycle and adeptly sorted the mail into all the boxes. From what Ushikawa could make out, half of it was junk mail, stuff that would be tossed away unopened. As the sun rose higher, the temperature went up, and most of the people along the street took off their coats. It was after eleven when Fukaeri appeared at the entrance to the building. She wore the same black turtleneck as before, a grey short coat, jeans, sneakers and dark sunglasses, and an oversized green shoulder bag slung diagonally across her shoulder. The bag was bulging with, no doubt, all sorts of things. Uchikawa left the building he was leaning against, went over to the camera on the tripod and squinted through the viewfinder. The girl was leaving there. That much he understood. She had stuffed all her belongings in that bag and was setting off for somewhere else. She would never be back there again. He could sense it. Maybe she decided to leave here, he thought, because she noticed I was staking out the place. The thought made his heart race. As she stepped out of the entrance, she came to a halt and stared at the sky like she had done before, searching for something among the tangle of electric lines and the transformers. Her sunglasses caught the light and glittered. Had she found what she was looking for? Or maybe not? He couldn't read her expression through the sunglasses. She must have stood there, frozen for a good thirty seconds gazing up at the sky. Then almost as an afterthought, she turned her head and looked straight at the window behind which Ushikawa was hiding. She took off her sunglasses and stuck them in a coat pocket. She frowned and focused her gaze right on the camouflaged telephoto lens. She knows, Ushikawa thought once again. The girl knows I'm hiding in here that she's being secretly watched. And she was looking at him in the opposite direction, watching Ushikawa through the lens and back through the viewfinder, like water flowing backward through a curved pipe. Ushikawa felt the flesh crawl on both his arms. 
for Curdie blinked every few moments. Like independent, silent, living creatures, her eyelids slowly went up and down in a steadied way. Nothing else moved. She stood there, like some lofty bird with neck twisted, staring straight at Ushikawa. He couldn't pull his eyes away from her. It felt as if the entire world had come to a momentary halt. There was no wind, and sounds no longer made the air vibrate. Finally, Fukuhiri stopped looking at him. She raised her head again and gazed up at the sky, as she had done a moment before. This time, though, she stopped after a couple of seconds. Her expression was unchanged. She took the dark sunglasses out of her pocket, then put them on again, and headed toward the street. She walked with a smooth, unhesitant stride. I should go out and follow her. Tengo isn't back yet, and I have the time to find out where she's going. It couldn't hurt to find out where she's moving to. But somehow, Ushikawa couldn't stand up from the floor. His body was numb. That sharp gaze she had sent through the viewfinder had robbed him of the strength he needed to take action. It's okay, Ushikawa told himself as he sat there on the floor. Aomame is the one I have to locate. Eriko Fukada is a fascinating girl, but she's not my main priority here. She's just a supporting actress. If she's leaving, why not just let her go? Once on the main street, Fukadi hurried off toward the station. She didn't look back. Through the gap in the sun-bleached curtains, Ushikawa watched her as she went. Once the green shoulder bag, swinging back and forth, disappeared, he practically crawled away from the camera and leaned against the wall again, waiting for his strength to return. He took out a seven stars, lit it and inhaled the smoke deeply, but the cigarette was tasteless. His strength didn't return. His arms and legs still felt numb. He suddenly realized a strange space had formed inside him, a kind of pure hollow. This space signified a simple lack, a nothingness. Ushikawa sat there in the midst of this unknown void, unable to rise. He felt a dull pain in his chest. Not exactly pain, but more like the difference in air pressure at the point where the material and the immaterial meet. He sat for a long time at the bottom of that void, leaning against the wall, smoking tasteless cigarettes. When that girl left, she left behind this void. No, maybe not. Maybe she just showed me something that was already there, inside me. Ushikawa knew that Eriko Fukada had literally shaken him to his core. Her unwavering, pointed gaze shook him, not only physically, but to the center of his being like someone who had fallen passionately in love. He had never felt this way before in his life. No, that can't be right, he thought. Why should I be in love with that girl? We have to be the most ill-matched pair one could possibly imagine. He didn't need to check himself out in the mirror to confirm this, but this wasn't just about looks. In every possible aspect, he decided, no one is further removed from her than me. Sexually, he wasn't attracted to her. As far as sexual desire was concerned, a couple of times a month, Ushikawa called a prostitute he knew, and that was enough. Call her up, have her over to a hotel room, and have sex, like going to the barber. It had to be something on a more spiritual level, Ushikawa concluded. It was hard to accept, but Ushikawa and that lovely girl had, while staring at each other through opposite ends of the camouflaged telephoto lens, reached a kind of understanding 
that emanated from the deepest, darkest recesses of their beings. It had happened in an instant, yet they had laid bare their very souls, and then she had gone off, leaving Ushikawa behind, alone in this void. The girl knew I was secretly observing her through this telephoto lens, and she must have known, too, that I followed her to the supermarket near the station. She never looked back, even once, then, but she definitely knew I was there. But he hadn't seen any criticism in her eyes. Ushikawa felt that somehow, in some far-off deep place, she had understood him. The girl had shown up, then left. We came from different directions. Our paths happened to cross. Our eyes met for an instant, then we moved off in different directions once more. I probably won't ever run across Eriko Fukada again. Leaning against the wall, Ushikawa looked through the gap in the curtain and watched people coming and going. Maybe Fukari would come back. Maybe she would remember something important she had left back in the apartment. But she didn't. She had made up her mind to move on to somewhere else, and she would never return. Ushikawa spent the afternoon feeling deeply powerless. The sense of importance was formless, weightless. His blood moved slowly, sluggishly through his veins. It was as if his vision were covered by a fine mist, while the joints in his arms and legs felt creaky and dull. When he shut his eyes, the ache of her gaze stabbed at his ribs. The ache rolling in and out like gentle waves at the shore, rolling in again, then receding. Sometimes the pain was so great it made him wince. At the same time, though, Ushikawa realized it gave him a warm feeling like nothing he had ever experienced. His wife and two daughters, his snug little house with a lawn in Chorinkan, they had never made him feel this warm. He had always had something like a clod of frozen dirt stuck in his heart, a hard, cold core he had always lived with. He had never even felt it as cold. For him, this was normal temperature. Even so, Fukaedi's gaze had, if even for a moment, melted that icy core, and it brought on the dull ache. The warmth and the pain came as a pair, and unless he accepted the pain, he wouldn't feel the warmth. It was a kind of trade-off. In a little sunny spot, Ushikawa experienced the pain and the warmth simultaneously. Quietly, without moving a muscle, it was a calm, peaceful winter's day. People on the street passed through the delicate sunshine as they strolled by, but the sun was steadily moving west, hidden in the shadow of the building, and the little pool of sunlight he was in soon disappeared. The warmth of the afternoon was gone, and the cold of the night was gathering around him. Ushikawa sighed deeply and reluctantly peeled himself away from the wall. His body still had a lingering numbness, but not enough to stop him from moving about the room. He finally rose to his feet and stretched his limbs and moved his short, thick neck around to work out the nicks. He balled his fists, then stretched out his fingers again and again. Then he got down on the tatami and did his usual stretching exercises. All his joints crackled dully, and his muscles slowly regained their normal suppleness. It was now the time of the day when people came back from work and school. I need to continue to keep a watch over them, he told himself. This isn't a question of whether I want to or not, or whether it's the right thing to do. Once I start something, I have to see it through. Ushikawa sat down again behind the camera. It was completely dark outside now, and the light of the entrance had come on. 
it must be on a timer, he thought. Like nameless birds returning to their shabby nests, people stepped into the entrance. Tengo Kawana wasn't among them, but Ushikawa figured he would be back before long. He couldn't take care of his sick father forever. Most likely he would be back in Tokyo before the new week started, so he could return to work. Within a few days, or maybe even today, or tomorrow. I may well be just a cheerless, grubby little creature, a bug on the damp underside of a rock. So be it. I'll be the first to admit it. But I'm a relentlessly capable, patient, tenacious bug. I don't give up easily. Once I get a hold of a clue, I pursue it to the bitter end. I'll climb up the highest wall you've got. I have to get back that cold core inside me. Right now, that's exactly what I need. Ushikawa rubbed his hands together in front of the camera and checked to make sure all ten fingers were working properly. There are lots of things ordinary people can do that I can't, that's for sure. Play tennis, skiing, for instance. Working in a company, having a happy family. On the other hand, there are a few things I can do that most people can't. And I do these few things very, very well. I'm not expecting applause or for people to shower me with coins. But I do need to show the world what I am capable of. At 9.30, Ushikawa ended his surveillance for the day. He heated a can of chicken soup over the portable stove and carefully sipped it with a spoon. He ate two cold rolls, then polished off an apple, peel and all. He peed, brushed his teeth, spread out his sleeping bag, stripped down to his underwear, and snuggled inside. He zipped the bag up to his neck and curled up like a bug. And thus, Ushikawa's day was over. It hadn't been a very productive day. All he had been able to do was watch Fukeri exit the building with all her belongings. He didn't know where she had gone. Somewhere, but where? Inside the sleeping bag, he shook his head. Wherever she went, it didn't concern him. After a time, his frozen body warmed up. His mind faded and he fell into a deep sleep. Once more, the tiny frozen core occupied a solid place in his soul. Nothing much happened the next day. Two days later was Saturday, another warm, peaceful day. Most people slept in during the morning. Ushikawa, though, sat by the window, listening to a tiny radio. The news, traffic updates, the weather report. Just before ten, a large crow flew up and stood at the empty front steps of the building. The crow looked around meticulously, moving its head a few times like it was nodding. It bobbed its thick, large beak up and down, its brilliant black feathers glistening in the sunlight. The mailman pulled up on his small red motorcycle, and the crow reluctantly spread its wings wide and flew off. As it flew away, it squawked once. After the mailman had sorted all the mail into the mailboxes and left, a flock of sparrows twittered over. They bustled around the entrance but found nothing worthwhile and flew away. Next, it was a striped cat's turn. He had on a flea collar and probably belonged to a neighbour. Ushikawa had never seen the cat before. The cat peed in the dried up flower bed, sniffed the result and, apparently displeased with what it found, twitched its whiskers as if it were bored. Tailed up, it disappeared behind the building. In the morning, several residents exited the building. From the way they were dressed, it looked like they were going out for a relaxed day or going shopping in the neighborhood, one or the other. Ushikawa knew almost all their faces by now, but he had not a speck of interest in their personalities or private lives. 
he never even tried to imagine them. Your own lives are surely very important to each one of you, very precious to you. I get it, but to me they don't matter one way or the other. To me they're just flimsy paper dolls walking across a stage. There's only one thing I'm asking of all of you: remain paper dolls and don't interfere with my job here. Isn't that right, Mrs. Pear? He had given the woman currently passing this nickname because she was pear-shaped, with a huge rear end. You're just a cut-out paper doll. You're not real. Do you realize that? Though you are a bit on the chunky side for a paper doll. As he thought this, though, everything in the scene before him began to seem meaningless. To not matter one way or the other. Maybe the scene in front of him didn't exist in the first place. Maybe he was the one being deceived by cut-out people who didn't really exist. Ushikawa grew uneasy, being locked up in this empty apartment day after day, spying on people must be getting to him. Something that would definitely get on a person's nerves. He decided to verbalize his thoughts to pull himself out of this funk. Good morning, there, long ears," he said, looking through the viewfinder and addressing a tall, thin old man. The tips of the old man's ears stuck out like horns from beneath his white hair. Out for a walk? Walking is good for you. It's nice out today, so have a good time. I would love to take a walk and stretch my limbs a bit, but I'm stuck here. Keeping watch over this crummy entrance day after day. The old man had on a cardigan and wool trousers, and excellent posture. He would look perfect taking a faithful white dog out for a walk. But pets weren't allowed in the building. Once the old man had gone, Ushikawa was suddenly struck by a sense of impotence. This surveillance is going to end up being a waste of time," he decided. "My intuition is worthless, and all the hours I've spent in this vacant room are leading me exactly nowhere. All I have to show for it is a set of frayed nerves, worn away like the bald head of a Jizo statue that passing children rub for good luck. After twelve. Ushikawa ate an apple and some cheese and crackers, and a rice ball with pickled plum inside. He then leaned back against the wall and fell asleep. It was a short, dreamless sleep. Yet when he awoke, he couldn't remember where he was. His memory was a perfectly square, perfectly empty box. The only thing in the box was empty space. Ushikawa gazed around the space. He found it wasn't just a void, but a dim room, empty, cold, without a stick of furniture. He didn't recognize the place. There was an apple core on an unfolded newspaper next to him. Ushikawa felt confused. Why am I in such a weird place? Finally, it came to him. And he remembered what he had been doing, staking out the entrance to Tengo's apartment. That's right. That's why I have the single lens reflex Minolta with a telephoto lens. He remembered the old man with white hair and long ears out for a walk alone, like birds flying home to their nests at twilight. Memories gradually returned to the empty box, and two solid facts emerged. One. Eriko Fukada has left. Two, Tango Kawana hasn't come back yet. No one was in Tango Kawana's third-floor apartment. The curtains were drawn, and silence enveloped the deserted space. Other than the compressor of the fridge switching on from time to time, nothing disturbed the silence. Ushikawa let his imagination wander over the scene. Imagining a deserted room was a lot like imagining the world after death.
Suddenly, he remembered the NHK fee collector and his obsessive knocking. He had kept constant watch, but never saw any trace that this mysterious man had left the building. Could he be a resident here? Or was it someone who lived here who liked to pretend to be a fee collector to harass the other residents? If the latter, what would possibly be the point? This was a very morbid theory, but what else could explain such a strange situation? Ushikawa had no idea. Tengo Kawana showed up at the entrance to the apartment building just before four that afternoon. He wore an old windbreaker with the collar turned up, a navy blue baseball cap, a travel bag slung over his shoulder, he didn't pause at the entrance, didn't glance around and went straight inside. Ushikawa's mind was still a bit foggy, but he couldn't miss that large figure. Welcome back, Mr. Kawana, Ushikawa muttered aloud, and snapped three photos with the motor drive camera. How's your father doing? You must be exhausted. Please rest up. Nice to come home, isn't it? Even to a miserable place like this. By the way, Eriko Fukada moved out, with all her belongings, while you were gone. But his voice didn't reach Tengo. He was just muttering to himself. Ushikawa glanced at his watch and wrote a memo in his notebook. 3.56pm. Tengo Kawana, back home from trip. At the same moment that Tango appeared at the entrance, a door somewhere opened wide and Nushikawa felt reality returning. Like air rushing into a vacuum, his nerves were instantly sharp, his body filled with a fresh vitality. He was again a useful part of the outside world. There was a satisfying click as things fell into place. His circulation sped up, and just the right amount of adrenaline surged through his body. Good. This is how it should be. This is the way I'm supposed to be. The way the world is supposed to be. It was after 7pm when Tango appeared at the entrance again. The wind had picked up after sunset, and the temperature had dropped. Tango wore a sweater under a windbreaker with faded jeans. He stepped outside and stood there, looking around, but he didn't see anything. He glanced at where Ushikawa was hiding, but didn't pick out the observer. He's different from Eriko Fukada, Ushikawa thought. She's special. She can see what others can't. But you, Tengo, for better or worse, you're an ordinary person. You can't see me sitting here. Seeing that nothing had changed outside, Tango zipped up his jacket to his neck and stuck his hands in his pockets and walked out onto the main road. Ushikawa hurried, put on his knit cap, wrapped the muffler around his neck, slipped on his shoes and went out to follow Tango. Tango strolled slowly down the street and turned around to look behind him a few times, but Ushikawa was careful and Tango didn't see him. Tengo seemed to have something on his mind. Perhaps he was thinking about Fukaeri being gone. He was apparently heading toward the station. Maybe he was going to take a train somewhere. That would make tailing him difficult. The station was well lit, and on a Saturday night, there wouldn't be any passengers. Ushikawa would be extremely conspicuous. In that case, it would be smarter to give up. But Tengo wasn't heading toward the station. He walked for a while, then turned down a nearly deserted street and came to a halt in front of a bar named Mugiatama. It was a bar for young people, by the look of it. Tengo glanced at his watch to check the time and stood there, pondering for a few seconds, then went inside. Mugiatama, Ushikawa thought. He shook his head. What a stupid name for a bar. Ushikawa stood in the shadow of a telephone pole and checked out his surroundings. Tango was probably going to have a couple of drinks there and a bite to eat, so it would take at least a half hour. 
Worst case scenario, Ushikawa would have to stay put for an hour and looked around for a good place nearby to kill time while he watched the people going in and out of the bar. Unfortunately though, there was just a milk distributor, a small tenrikyo meeting hall, and a rice wholesaler, and all of them were closed. Man, I never get a break, he thought. The strong northwest wind blew the clouds swiftly by. The warmth of the daytime seemed like a dream now. Ushikawa wasn't relishing the idea of standing in the freezing cold for thirty minutes to an hour, doing nothing. Maybe I should give up. Tango's just having a meal here. There is no need to go to all the trouble of shadowing him. Ushikawa considered popping in to some place himself, having a hot meal, then going home. Tango would come back home before long. That was a very attractive choice. Ushikawa pictured himself in a cozy little restaurant, enjoying a piping hot bowl of oyakodon, rice topped with chicken and eggs. These last few days, he hadn't eaten anything worth mentioning. Some hot sake would hit the spot too. In this cold, one step outside and you'll sober up quick. But another scenario came to him. Tango might be meeting somebody at Mugiyatama. When Tango left his apartment, he went straight there, and he checked his watch just before he went in. Someone might be waiting for him inside, and might be on his way. If that is the case, Ushikawa had to know who this person was. His ears might freeze off, but he had to stand and watch, and see who went into the bar. He resigned himself to this, wiping the picture of Oyakodon and hot sake from his mind. The person he's meeting might be Fukaedi, or Aomame. Ushikawa pulled himself together. After all, perseverance is my strong point. If there was a glimmer of hope, he clung to it desperately. The rain could pelt him, the wind could blow. He could be burned by the sun and beaten with a stick, but he would never let go. Once you let go, you never know when you will get a hold of it again. He knew full well there were more painful things than this in the world, a thought that helped him endure his own suffering. He leaned against the wall, in the shadows of the telephone pole and a sign advertising the Japanese Communist Party and kept a sharp watch over the front door of Mugiyatama. He wrapped the green muffler to his nose and stuck his hands inside the pockets of his pea coat. Other than occasionally extracting a tissue from his pocket to blow his nose, he didn't move an inch. Announcements over the PA system at Koenji Station would filter over on the wind from time to time. Some pedestrians looked nervous when they saw Ushikawa huddled in the shadows and hurried past. Since it was dark though, they couldn't make out his features. His stocky frame loomed in the shadows like some ominous ornament and sent people scurrying away in fright. What could Tengo be drinking and eating in there? The more he thought about it, the hungrier and colder he got, but he couldn't help imagining it. Anything's fine. Doesn't have to be hot sake or oyakodon. I just want to go someplace warm and have a regular meal. But if I can stand being out here in the cold, I can take anything. Ushikawa had no choice. There was no other path for him to take than this one, freezing in the cold wind until Tengo finished his meal. Ushikawa thought about his home in Chuorinkan, and the dining table there. There must have been hot meals on that table every day, but he couldn't recall them. What in the world did I eat back then? It was like something out of antiquity. Long, long ago, a fifteen-minute walk from Chuorinkan Station on the Odaku Line, there had been a newly built house and a warm, inviting dinner table. 
two little girls played piano, and a small pedigreed puppy scampered about the tiny garden and lawn. Tango came out of the bar thirty-five minutes later. Not bad. It could have been a lot worse. Ushikawa reassured himself. The thirty-five minutes had been terrible, but it was certainly better than an awful hour and a half. His body was chilled, but at least his ears hadn't frozen. While Tengo was in the bar, there was no one going in or out of Mugiatama who caught Ushikawa's attention. Just one couple went inside, and no one came out. Tengo must have just had a few drinks and a light meal. Keeping the same distance as before, Ushikawa followed behind him. Tenga walked down the same street, most likely headed back to his apartment. But Tenga turned off the street and headed down a road that Ushikawa had never been on before. It looked like Tenga was not on his way home after all. Ushikawa was convinced that he was still lost in thought, maybe even more so than before. He didn't glance back this time. Ushikawa kept track of the scenery passing by, checked the street signs, trying to memorize the route so he could retrace it later on. Ushikawa wasn't familiar with this area, but from increasing buzz of traffic, like the rushing of a river, he surmised they must be getting closer to the Ring Road. Before long, Tengo picked up the pace, getting closer to his destination, perhaps. Not bad. So this guy is heading somewhere. It was worth tailing him after all. Tengo quickly cut through a residential street. It was a Saturday night with a cold wind blowing, so everyone else was inside, in front of the TV, enjoying a hot drink. The street was practically deserted. Ushikawa followed behind Tengo, making sure to keep enough distance between them. Tengo was an easy type of person to shadow. He was tall and big boned, and wouldn't get lost in a crowd. He just forged on ahead and didn't get sidetracked. He was always looking slightly down, thinking. He was essentially a straightforward, honest man, not the type to hide anything. Totally different from me, Ushikawa thought. Ushikawa's wife had also liked to hide things. No, it wasn't that she liked to hide things. She couldn't help it. Ask her what time it was, and she probably wouldn't tell you the correct time. Ushikawa wasn't like this. He only hid things when it was necessary, only when it pertained to work. If someone asked him the time, and there was no reason for him to be dishonest, he would tell them and be nice about it. Not like his wife. She even lied about her age. Shaving four years off, when they submitted the documents for the marriage license, he found out how old she really was, but pretended not to notice. Ushikawa couldn't fathom why she had to lie about something that was going to come out anyway. Who cared if his wife happened to be seven years older? As they got even farther from the station, there were fewer people on the street. Eventually, Tango turned into a little park. A nothing little playground in one corner of a residential district. The park was deserted. Of course it is, Ushikawa thought. Who feels like spending time in a playground on a cold, windy December night? Tengo passed under the cold light of a mercury vapor lamp and headed straight toward the slide. He stepped onto it and climbed to the top. Ushikawa hid behind a phone booth and kept an eye on Tengo. A slide? Ushikawa frowned. Why does a grown man have to climb to the top of a slide on a freezing cold night like this? This wasn't near Tengo's apartment. There must be some reason he would go out of his way to come here. It wasn't exactly the most appealing playground. It was cramped and shabby. In addition to the slide, there were two swings, a small jungle gym, and a sandbox. A single mercury vapor lamp that looked like it had illuminated the end of the world more than a few times. A single crude, leafless zelkova tree. 
A locked up public toilet was the perfect canvas for graffiti. There was not a thing in this park to warm people's hearts or to stimulate the imagination. Perhaps a bracing May afternoon there might be something, but on a windy December night, forget it. Was Tango meeting up with somebody here, waiting for somebody to show? Ushikawa didn't think so. Tango didn't give any signs to indicate that he was looking for someone. When he entered the park, he ignored all the other equipment. The only thing on his mind seemed to be the slide. Tengo came here to climb up that slide. Maybe he had always liked to sit on top of slides when he needed to think. Maybe the top of a slide in a park at night was the perfect place to think about the plot of the novel he was writing, or mathematical formulas. Maybe the darker it was, the colder the wind blew, the shabbier the park, the better he could think. What or how novelists or mathematicians thought was way beyond anything Ushikawa could imagine. His practical mind told him that he had to stay put, patiently keeping an eye on Tengo. His watch showed exactly 8 p.m. Tengo sat down on top of the slide as if folding his large frame. He looked up at the sky. He moved his head back and forth, then settled on a single spot and gazed upward, his head still. Ushikawa recalled a sentimental old pop song called Kyu Sakamoto. It began, look up at the night sky, see the little stars. He didn't know how the rest of it went and he really didn't care to know. Sentiment and a sense of justice were Ushikawa's two weakest areas. Up on top of the slide was Tengo feeling sentimental as he gazed at the stars. Ushikawa tried looking up at the sky himself, but he couldn't see any stars. Koenji, Suginami Ward, Tokyo, was not the best place to observe the night sky. Neon signs and lights along the street dyed the whole sky a weird colour. Some people, if they squinted hard, might be able to make out a few stars, but that would require extraordinary vision and concentration. On top of that, the clouds tonight were blowing hard across the sky. Still, Tengo sat motionless on top of the slide, his eyes on a fixed point in the sky. What a pain in the butt the sky is, Ushikawa decided. What possible reason could there be to sit on a slide, gaze up at the sky, and ponder things on a windy winter night like this? Not that he had any right to criticize Tengo. Ushikawa had taken it upon himself, after all, to secretly observe Tengo and shadow him. Tengo was a free citizen and had every right to look at what he wanted, where he wanted, the whole year round. Still, it's damn cold. He had needed to pee for some time, but had held it in. The public toilet was locked, though, and even in a deserted place like this, he couldn't very well just pee next to a phone booth. Come on, he thought, stamping his feet. Can't you just get up and leave already? You might be lost in thoughts, overtaken by sentiment, deep into your astronomical observations. But Tengo, you gotta be freezing too. Time to go back to your place and warm up, don't you think? Neither of us has anyone waiting for us, but it's still a hell of a lot better than hanging out here and freezing our rear ends off. Tengo didn't seem to get up though. He finally stopped gazing at the sky and turned his attention to the apartment building across the way. It was a new condo, six stories tall with lights on in about half the windows. Tengo stared at the building. Ushikawa did the same but found nothing that caught his attention. It was just an ordinary condo. It was not an exclusive building but fairly high class nonetheless. High quality design, expensive tile exterior. The entrance was beautiful and well lit. It was a different animal entirely from the cheap, slated-to-be-torn-down place that Tango called home. 
as he gazed up at the condo, was Tengo wishing he could live in a place like that? Ushikawa didn't think so. As far as Ushikawa knew, Tengo wasn't the type to care about where he lived. Just like he didn't care much about clothes. Most likely he was happy with his shabby apartment. A roof over your head and a place to keep out of the cold, that was enough for him. Whatever was running through his head up there in the slide must be something else. After Tengo had looked at all the windows in the condo, he turned his gaze once more to the sky. Ushikawa followed suit from where he was hidden. The branches of the Zelkova tree, the electric lines and the other buildings got in the way. He could only see half the sky. What particular point in the sky Tengo was looking at wasn't at all clear. Countless clouds ceaselessly scudded across the sky like some overwhelming army bearing down on them. Eventually, Tengo stood up and silently climbed down from the slide like a pilot having just landed after a rough solo flight at night. He cut across the playground and left. Ushikawa hesitated, then decided not to follow him. Most likely, Tengo was on his way back to his place. Plus, Ushikawa had to pee like crazy. After he saw Tengo disappear, he went into the playground, hustled behind the public toilet, and in the darkness where no one could see him, he peed into a bush. His bladder was ready to burst. He finally finished peeing, the operation taking as long as it would take a long freight train to cross a bridge, zipped up his pants, shut his eyes, and gave a deep sigh of relief. His watch showed 8.17. Tango had been on top of the slide for about 15 minutes. Ushikawa checked again that Tango wasn't around and headed toward the slide. He clambered up the ladder with his short, bandy legs, sat down on the very top of the freezing slide, and looked up. What could he have been staring at so intently? Ushikawa had pretty good eyesight. Astigmatism made his eyes a bit out of balance, but generally he could get by every day without glasses. Still, no matter how hard he looked, he couldn't make out a single star. What caught his attention instead was the large moon in the sky, about two-thirds full. Its dark, bruised exterior was clearly exposed between the clouds, your typical winter moon. Cold, pale, full of ancient mysteries and inklings. Unblinking like the eyes of the dead, it hung there, silent, in the sky. Ushikawa gulped. For a while, he forgot to breathe. Through a break in the clouds, there was another moon. A little way apart from the first one, this was much smaller than the original moon, slightly warped in shape and green, like it had moss growing on it. But it was undoubtedly a moon. No star was that big, and it couldn't be a satellite. Yet there it was, pasted onto the night sky. Ushikawa shut his eyes, then a few seconds later opened them again. This must be an illusion. That kind of thing can't be there. But no matter how many times he opened and closed his eyes, the little moon was still in the sky. Passing clouds hid it occasionally, but once they passed by, there it was, in the same exact spot. This was what Tengo was looking at. Tengo Kawana had come to this playground to see this scene, or perhaps to check that it still existed. He has known for some time that there are two moons, no doubt about it. He didn't look at all surprised to see it, on top of the slide, Ushikawa sighed deeply. What kind of crazy world is this? He asked himself. 
What sort of world have I gotten myself into? But no answer came. Swept by countless clouds racing by, the two moons, one big, one small, hung in the sky like a riddle. There's one thing I can say for sure, he decided. This isn't the world I came from. The earth I know has only one moon. That is an undeniable fact. And now it has increased to two. Ushikawa began to have a sense of deja vu. I've seen the same thing before somewhere, he thought. He focused, desperately searching his memory. He frowned, grit his teeth, dredging the dark sea bottom of his mind. And it finally hit him. Air chrysalis. He looked around, but all he saw was the same world as always. White lace curtains were drawn in the windows in the condo across the street. Peaceful lights on behind them, nothing out of the ordinary. Only the number of moons was different. He carefully climbed down from the slide and hurriedly left the playground as if running from the eyes of the moons. Am I going nuts? He wondered. No, that can't be. I'm not going crazy. My mind is like a brand new steel nail. Hard, sober, straight. Hammered at just the right angle into the core of reality. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm completely sane. It's the world around me that's gone crazy. And I have to find out why. End of chapter.